Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor is with us back in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about the economics of Mongolia. But first something more in the news, or if not in the news, maybe from people's lives. The data point there is 15.9 billion. That's in dollars. And it is the total amount of global pencil sales in the year 2022. More than half of consumers have already started their back to class shopping. And with the prices rising over the last two years, shoppers, of course, looking for some deals. Back to school shopping season is here. And this year, parents are expected to shell out big bucks for their kids. That's right. The National Retail Federation is predicting a record spending season. Of course, we're now entering September, which here in Germany, but also in the US, probably also elsewhere, means we're entering back to school season. And, you know, what better symbol we thought of school than the humble pencil. But, you know, thanks to Milton Friedman, one of the heralds of neoliberal economics, it's more than just a symbol of school. It's a metaphor for the free market economy, or it's become one, thanks to a 1980 television program that Milton Friedman hosted called Freedom to Choose, in which he drew on an essay called I Pencil to argue that the humble pencil on every school child's backpack was actually a window into the workings of the global free market. To quote him, he said, there's not a single single person person in the the world world who could make this pencil. Who could make this pencil. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. Uh, He also suggested that this was uh, an indication of the the magic magic of of the the price price system. The impersonal operation of prices that brought them together and got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. So we thought we would get into all aspects of the pencil, both as a, you know, school child's instrument, but also as this sort of symbol that it's become in the economic discourse. I guess to start there, Adam, yeah, this essay I pencil that Milton Friedman drew on, if you get into it, it's a pretty clear parable about interdependence and specialization, all by way of a kind of genealogy of where the pencil comes from, how it's made. But Friedman, he uses the essay to tell a story about the centrality of the price mechanism. And I was curious whether, you know, the seeds of this neoliberal story that Friedman's telling, whether it's already contained in that essay he was drawing on, or is this really more revealing about Friedman himself as a public communicator, kind of maybe someone who's both a bit sentimental, but maybe also distorting in his economics communication. Yeah, this is a fascinating uh, fascinating topic you came up with, and it really was your idea, because I have to say I was completely taken aback when I got the questions like, what is this, I pencil <laughs> thing? Like, I had no idea. I don't remember the Milton Friedman. I think I watched it, but um, I don't remember it as vividly as you do, if, if, if it was like recall. I mean, I am familiar, obviously, in the history of market economics, there's a long history of using examples, parables like this, that the the more famous one for students of economics is Adam Smith's Pin Factory. And apparently Denis Diderot, the great French Enlightenment philosopher and literateur, also used a pin factory example. So this this idea of of using a simple thing, a seemingly simple everyday object as a way of understanding the division of labor is obviously a, it's an attractive kind of hook. And I mean, I use it in my own teaching, to be honest. I often invite students to look around the classroom and say, well, where did all this come from? And in the first instance, and the essay by Leonard Reed, I pencil is, you know, hugely to be recommended. It, it's a fascinating, I, I think an absolutely brilliant piece of rhetoric and writing. And I in fact actually learned a lot about pencils from reading it. So it's online, it's, on, it's free. Um, and when you read Leonard Reed's essay, and then think about the use that Friedman made of it, you could come away a little bit indignant on Reed's behalf in that the essay actually doesn't mention prices or markets. It's really an engineering piece. It's about, you know, the extraordinary 
it's like a supply chain story, essentially, one of these stories that we've gotten very familiar with in recent years since COVID and the confrontation with China and so on. Look at all of the ingenious things that go into the pencil. Think about the ramified chains of production that are involved. And indeed, this question of knowledge is central. Like he makes this great point that, you know, everyone knows well, pretty much everyone who's literate knows how to use a pencil, but absolutely none of us can make one. And in fact, you know, in the chain of making a pencil, it's pretty hard to imagine who at any given stage could make the whole thing. So it's a it's a beautiful description of the division of labor. And then you could think, oh, naughty, naughty Friedman, like he's imposed prices and markets on top of this story, which you could also think of in lots of other ways, you know, is is Reed just simply some kind of libertarian anarchist? Well, well, he is, but then if you dig into his biography, I think, you know, it's completely legitimate. Friedman is not traducing Reed in any way whatsoever. I mean, Reed was a notorious, legendary, famous, however you choose to characterize it, advocate of the free market. The Economics Education Society that he founded with corporate sponsorship was one of the precursors of the Mont Pelerin Society that is the you know the global progenitor of neoliberalism. He was an evangelical Christian committed to the idea, I think, that individual freedom through private property markets and prices in some sense is revealed, not in a direct way, but indirectly, if you like, the wisdom of a divinely ordained order more complex than we could understand. And, you know, so really, you know, Friedman is, <laughs> you might say, doing the law's work in translating this into a popular TV show. It is true, prices don't show up anyway in Reed's essay, but I think that's the point, right? You're, you're supposed to read the essay and go, oh, tell me, how is this organized? And to which the response is, oh, well, through private property markets, incentives. What the essay does quite manifestly contain is a critique of governmentalism. So it's a critique... You know, the idea in the essay is, well, you might imagine that something as complex as this could only be organized by a single coordinating hand, a human hand, a state, a government. And Reed's point is, no, it's not that. But then he leaves open and drives you thereby, I think, to the conclusion that other mechanisms must be doing the work. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious, you know, for all they've been cited as an example of globalization in this way, how internationalized exactly are pencil manufacturers these days. I mean, in my research, it does seem like pencils seem to vary a fair amount country by country, like in terms of, I guess, what the population would imagine as the archetypal pencil in terms of the color, the shape, maybe even the composition of it. And is that because the companies that make these pencils tend to be based locally or do internationalized companies incorporate local knowledge into their pencil production these days? I think it depends which level of the pencil world hierarchy you're involved in. I, I, for me too, this was an incredible trip into a rabbit hole of things I really had never thought about seriously. But there are some amazing websites. My favorite is one called Bleistift. So this is the German word for, for pencil, which is a truly like a global pencil nerds meeting point with extraordinary descriptions of the latest fashions in writing equipment. I, I, I gather nowadays the classic wood uh, graphite pencil is retreating very much in the face of the automated pencil, uh, or not the automated pencil, the, you know, the, the essentially plastic or metal. Um, um, mechanical pencil is what we use. Mechanical call. pencil, there you go, like always sharp, that, that kind of vision. But I mean, it's an industry which is like most other industries of this type, dominated by China with a sprinkling of other producers. There is still a significant European presence in the form of uh, Germany with brand names like Faber Castell as, you know, a major player. But it seems like a pretty classic instance of, you know, relatively low tech, relatively low value man mass manufacturing onto which then is grafted a craft, high-end, design-driven segment, which is very, very tiny by comparison with, uh, you know, if you take your kids to Walmart or Woolworths or whatever, wherever you buy school supplies for the beginning of the year, you're buying something that is being produced in a highly streamlined market organization mediated process that, you know, that uh, <laughs> governs how much it's going to cost to buy all the colored pens the kids want and and everything else. And it follows, broadly speaking, the outlines, the contours of the global economy, as you'd imagine them combining. And this is where the Reed essay really does strike home, like this, this incredible complexity of physical components in a single, apparently integrated object. 
So, okay, so I understand it's the last step that is actually kind of a local process, but otherwise this is all kind of... In some particular cases, I don't think we should exaggerate mm. the locality even of that mm. in most cases. Like, you know, the vast majority of writing equipment that people will buy is highly standardized and you know you it's one of the it's one after all of the comforting things if you're traveling with kids i don't need to tell you is like you can take them into a right a heart you know a, a shop with pencils and it's pretty yeah. much the same as at home with some interesting local variations but broadly speaking we all know what we're going to end up with yeah but but if you go to the high end level then it's a completely different ball game hmm. so in terms of the production process most of the graphite which is largely or traditionally what produces the marks of a pencil most of that graphite is produced by china these days and you know we all talk about de-risking as a factor in the global economy yeah does this kind of cornering of the graphite market by china pose any kind of vulnerability i mean and i guess i mean this in a in, in a double sense could other producers ramp up production of graphite if they needed to and how critical then is graphite in the first place? I mean, could graphite itself be replaced with other natural resources? It was funny when you put this question to me, being ignorant about physical chemistry, I kind of couldn't help giggling at first. It's like, seriously, we're talking about the strategic yeah, significance of the of pencil then? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> could, could we? Could we? And then you Google and it's like, oh, oh, okay, now I understand. Like, absolutely, it's actually one of the most critical materials mm. there is. And it's not because it goes into pencils, it's because it goes into lithium-ion batteries. And so it's absolutely essential to the entire, in fact, like it's the unheralded strategic material that actually everyone should be focused on. And the EU has a has a graphite program and it's a huge deal, yeah. And China totally dominates it. And in large part because of the mechanisms, which are pretty familiar, which is they came out of the communist era in the 1990s in a kind of unfettered explosion of capacity growth and then dumped that on global markets and killed all the competition in the course of the 1990s. And then, you know, optimized, perfected and now are, you know, key players in the battery business. And so it's become a huge it's become a huge deal. So indeed, yes, expect to hear more about it. Maybe we should do a batteries episode and I will, or maybe another batteries episode and I will try and get smarter about this. But I gather also that the particular form in which graphite is used in pencils has some properties, which I would need to understand far more about to be able to talk about intelligently, that make it rather promising as a potential innovative next generation battery material. So extraordinarily, the story does lead back to pencils and the graphene, I think it's called, that is used in them, which could be a key to a new battery future. But that story is moving so fast. Some of the stuff I was reading is five years old. I'm wondering whether that's actually still current. In any case, yes, graphite's a big deal. Okay, wow. Well, I'm, I'm, picture, I'm picturing the possibility of like strategic pencil reserves that could be diverted. No, no, batteries. no, 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 okay. no, 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 don't go that. No, that's okay. not what we're talking about no. here. All right. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just, <laughs> yes, I can imagine you can with like a large, you've got your personal family no, stock I, of pencils. No, I think it like, could be a platform. Darling, why do we need all these pencils? It could, ah, honey, it'll be worth so much money. No, no, I'm picturing more something like it sounds like a, some kind of, you know, sentimental populist platform that Biden could run on, like a kind of strategic pencil reserve for our kids and for batteries. <laughs> Everyone should have you know, one stuck behind their ear at all yeah. times. Like, <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> but uh, anyway, I guess to end here, it struck me that pencils go hand in hand with erasers. And I'm wondering whether erasers have a different story about globalization to tell than the one about pencils that Milton Friedman and others have told. I'm thinking here about, you know, erasers as being tied to rubber cultivation, you know, uh, which is inextricable from the history of colonialism on one hand. But then the fact that erasers these days are probably mostly made from synthetic rubber, which itself is maybe was the product of, of government research into the production of, of that kind of synthetic material. So, yeah. What do you think about erasers in contrast to pencils? That's another absolutely fascinating story. So apparently the main way in which people did erasing 
until the rubber came along um, was bread. B- bread? Um, <laughs> maybe, yes, exactly. <laughs> this is an experiment to try with your kids at home. Dry bread. Absolutely. And apparently impoverished scholars, when they got really desperate, would eat their erasers. <laughs> As we know, children sometimes do this as well. There, there you go. So um, try it at home, maybe before you... I don't know. I'm not sure I'm recommending that people eat their erasers. But in any case, from the late 18th century onwards, people began to discover the way in which natural caoutchouc could produce an erasing effect. I don't really quite understand. I mean, like, you know, we've all watched the miracle. There's something about how it absorbs the graphite and then peels off. In any case... So this then became a driver, but it wasn't until vulcanization arrived in the 19th century, which is really, you know, this is Charles Goodyear's great invention of the 1830s that transforms caoutchouc and natural rubber from being a kind of curiosity to being a major industry. It transforms the properties of the the rubber that you began to see large scale production. This isn't synthetic rubber. This is transformed natural rubber. And roughly at the same time, because this was so expensive, notably in both Britain and France, various types of vulcanization process were then applied to other chemistry, other bits of chemistry. And they discovered that if you apply vulcanization to various types of fat oil, you could produce a synthetic rubber substitute additive. And this is something I I learned from reading the Reed essay, which is that the rubber at the end of most pencils is the vast majority of it is not caoutchouc or natural rubber, but something called factice, which is the French the French word or the French derived word for this synthetic rubber product, which then spread around the world. Um, and by the, you know, by the early 20th century, you, you have a global production of synthetic rubber factice. I don't know what they are, compounds, hybrids, which are then what you find on the end of pencils. Huh. Well, okay. That was a kind of quick tour de force of everything related to pencils i will um yeah not think about my kids backpack the same way at least uh, maybe that's true of others listening yeah if they say they forgot their rubber just tell them to you know use, use the their bread, bread no or, use their brötchen yeah. that makes sense from a german with german bread especially this kind of dense bread i can't you wouldn't do that with wonder bread i think that would kind of just come apart in, in a... you know what i see a really fascinating um experiment coming on here. yeah take the kids to the supermarket get like four different types of bread <laughs> and see which one has the best raising properties yeah it sounds like a strange punishment i could apply to good my kids. fun yeah. thing to do for uh, a rainy afternoon I would say. Yeah, great. Um, I can't can't wait to break that to my kids. But I, we do have to take a pause here for now. But we will be back to talk about the Mongolian economy. Hi, welcome back. Our next data point is 8,315. That's $8,315 per metric ton, which is the price of copper at the end of the second quarter of this year. That's off from a high of $9,356 earlier this year in January. Either way, copper has been in something of a bull market, and that has meant good news. For countries that make copper, among them Mongolia, which is the subject of this segment. Mongolia is one of the major producers of copper in the world. But not only that, it's also interesting in its own right. And so we thought we'd dedicate a whole segment to the Mongolian economy. Adam, first off, I thought we could try to get Mongolia situated a little bit. It's only been an independent country at all since the post-World War II period. And so I suppose prior to that, it was a part of China, right? And then its independence, though, was strongly supported by the Soviet Union, right? Yeah. So Mongolia acquired UN recognition in October 1961. And I think that's, you know, that's what you're referring to when you're saying it becomes an independent country after World War II. I mean, it's important to say, though, that this is we are really talking about Mongolia here. So in the 13th century, in the 1200s, Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan presided over the largest land empire the world has ever seen. So, you know, it's kind of a foreshortening of its history to say it's only become an independent country since, you know, 1961. No, I mean, this is one of the decisive forces in world history. It gave China the Huan dynasty. Um, It succumbed then regionally, if you like, to the great surge of Manchu power, which established, you know, the, the ancestors of the modern Chinese state. And yes, until 1911, 
until the Qing dynasty, the last Manchu dynasty falls, Mongolia was part of that giant Chinese empire. From 1911 onwards, successive governments in different forms are originally dynastic, and then the People's Republic, a socialist republic of Mongolia, have claimed independence. China resists this. Like So people may have these terms you know, floating around in their heads, inner and outer Mongolia. This is a Chinese distinction where the inner Mongolian bit is the bit which still belongs to China, and outer Mongolia is in fact the independent Mongolian state that really came into existence after 1911, was, as you said, strongly backed by Russia for obvious geopolitical reasons, and then very strongly backed by the communist regime, the Soviet regime. It was never, however, a Soviet socialist republic, so it was never part of the USSR. It was always an independent state, but with the patronage of the Soviet Union and with a communist party attached to the Soviet Union's communist party and following its inspiration and model, the hitch was that the Chinese wouldn't allow, and they had a veto, of course, in the UN, Mongolia to be recognized as an independent state. And so the Soviet Union bargained. And what the Soviet Union did, this is why 61 is so telling, is the Soviet Union vetoed the recognition by the UN of China-backed post-colonial African states and embarrassed the Chinese by a sense turning Mongolia into the cause for the non-recognition of Mauritania. And in the end, the Chinese gave way and under pressure from African allies, recognized Mongolia, outer Mongolia in their terms, Mongolia to everyone else as an independent state. And that is, as it were, Mongolia's status ever since. An independent state, giant state, huge. It's in terms of landmass, it's huge, sandwiched between what was once the Soviet Union and is now Russia, and on the other hand, China. So going back to Genghis Khan, uh, who you mentioned, and even Tamerlane, other sort of Mongol rulers from hundreds uh, of years ago, Mongolia has always been famous as a pastoral society, a society that lives on horseback. And I'm curious, how how did that function under communism? And then how was the transition from communism to, to market economics for Mongolia? I mean, it's a profoundly ambiguous story. I mean, the more I read about this, the more I wanted to read a book more about it, just to kind of wrap my head around it. But the the approximate outline of this is that, is that they actually did do a collectivization campaign, except that in this case, so, you know, we think of peasant collectivization, the standard model is you've got land, right? So you it's a territorial land grab and you seize control of the land and impose power. And that by itself is a huge radical shift, right? Because sovereign lords had always claimed notional control over the land, but de facto it had been with peasants and peasant communities, and this was the problem that brought down the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire in World War I. And the Soviets, the communists, made sure this wouldn't happen again through the ultra-violent collectivization of the Russian countryside, the, 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 not just Russian, Ukraine as well, of course, the entire territory of the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. What do you do when you collectivize herds? Um, but they did. Right? They collected, they created collective, nomadic, pastoral, uh, agricultural units with considerable infrastructure to support them. And this, as it were, is the ambiguity. On the one hand, it's clearly a story of power and coercion and control. And on the other hand, it is also undeniably, you see it in the raw data, the rolling out of infrastructure, the building of a controlled pastoral regime, and also the rolling out of modern education to what had previously been essentially an unschooled or a population that was only very scantily schooled. One of the price of that is that, on the other hand, you then create settled community, kids are in boarding schools. The upside is that you see a great degree of female emancipation that had previously been impossible, except in informal power structures within Mongolian society. That's about as far as I feel comfortable going and just kind of wrapping my head around the complexity of this. But yes, they did, the collectivization of herds, and they controlled the pastoral economy. And this is an important story about the post-Soviet period. But the shorthand about the immediate aftermath of the collapse of communism is that as that falls away, on the one hand, you get societal adaptation and in a sense, in some areas, the revival of old patterns of life that had been suppressed by collectivization. So there's a a sense of cultural reappropriation and rebirth, which is very significant. And on the other hand, you see a collapse in real incomes. So again, using these 
GDP per, you know, PPP numbers that we use a lot. And maybe at some point we should have an episode about purchasing power parity adjusted GDP numbers because we invoke them, I invoke them so much. But they're our best guess as to the cost of living adjusted measure of per capita income. And for Mongolia, it's staggering, the collapse, right? So they go from lower middle income developing economy, classic late Soviet, 1700 to close to $2,000 per capita to bare bones, $1 a day, $1.50 a day poverty by the early 1990s, right? So around 400 to 500, in, insofar as we can measure it. Like, so basically a, a retrogression. And it's not a huge society, so we're talking about 3 million people. So you can imagine this kind of happening, a retreat into various types of self-sufficiency, a breakdown in international trade. Think about what's going on in Soviet Union slash Russia at the time. Think about what's happening in China at the time. You can imagine how precarious the situation of a society sandwiched between those two really dramatic stories in the 1990s is. That's the, the basic message here is that for all the ambiguity that Soviet development brought with it, with collectivization and the imposition of more settled urban-based visions of the world, the collapse of that system in the early 1990s brought poverty. You don't see it. I was thought, okay, you're going to be able to see this in the life expectancy numbers. You don't. So you don't see a huge collapse in life expectancy, which you see in the late the 1990s in Russia, for instance. So that may be a statistical issue, but it does seem as though, as it were, you have a society which is able to support life, bare life, but one that pulls back from market entanglement, pulls back from modern economic activity, which then revives again from the late 90s onwards. And we're now, Mongolia's GDP per capita today is closer to 4,000. So that's in the lower middle income kind of bracket. Yeah, Mongolia has managed to achieve this kind of status as a a sort of middle income country. And, and I'm curious whether it's done so while continuing to kind of draw on its tradition of pastoral nomadism, its tradition of livestock herding. Has that been playing a key role in the Mongolian economy today? Yeah, in totally fascinating ways, it is. I mean, it's important, I think, especially for American listeners, when we say livestock, Americans will tend to think of cattle. Uh, what we're talking about here above all is goats. And what we're really talking about is Kashmir goats. Because Mongolia, along with China, Inner Mongolia being the Chinese side of this, is one of the major, the number two global producer of Kashmir, this extremely high value wool that is prized above all in the European fashion industry, which then largely exports back to you know very high income consumers in Asia. And so the Mongolian Kashmir herd is a huge thing. Um, 3.3 million people, 27 million Kashmir goats, so nine per person, like a quarter of the population still engaged in livestock farming in one way or the other. The place that people retreat to, traditionally at least, when the, the rest of the economy breaks down, so a major player in the, in the economy, but fragile. And this is where the story about the post-Soviet period gets really interesting because during the Soviet period, livestock herding was relatively controlled. The global Kashmir market wasn't there on the same scale. But what happens in the 90s and the early 2000s is that as the Soviet economy breaks down and the incomes fall, Mongolian society doubles down on livestock herding. And so the Kashmir population, the goat population explodes, all other forms of livestock herding explode. The total livestock herd goes to 70 million animals in a population of 3.3 million people. There's a lot of land in Mongolia, but nevertheless, what this then leads to is overgrazing. And combined with climate change, um, with extremely hot and very cold winters, the animal population becomes increasingly unstable. You get the beginnings of a new wave of major dust and sandstorms across the region, not just in Mongolia itself, but in the neighboring regions as well. And that then drives larger and larger numbers of people off the countryside towards Ulaanbaatar, towards the capital. And so the city itself, if you see pictures of it, I've never had the privilege of going, is this incredible kind of image of the of the dichotomy of this society because there's the Soviet and post-Soviet era skyscrapers going to the sky. And then all around there are the yurts, all around there are the, the what you know, what as a kind of tourist you imagine Mongolian society will look like, like a giant camp. Around the city, 800,000 people are estimated to live in these informal settlements around the capital. So it's a really, it's a really spectacularly interesting kind of coexistence of different modes of economic activity in the same space. 
Okay, so that that's fascinating on the economics of Kashmir, but it's not an accident that I started off the segment by talking about copper. You know, ultimately, it's mining, uh, in particular copper, that's been putting Mongolia in the news recently. First off, what, what accounts right now for this bull market in copper, and, and what effect does that have on the Mongolian economy? Yeah, copper is a story, again, another one for the hopper. We're going to need a lot of copper for the energy transition. That's the that's the basic story, right? If the the alpha and omega of the electric of the energy transition is electrification, and as everyone knows, copper is key to the electrification story as we know it. Now there may be technological shifts going on, but electrification is, as far as we know, that the Wait, just walk us through what does copper show up in? I mean, why is it so important to electrification? It's the conductor. Yeah. It's basically the conductor par excellence. It's the it's the common denominator of the electricity revolution. You need it in every single thing that's going to conduct electricity, mm. basically. And we're going to need tens of millions of tons. Some estimates put the figure out at 50 million or so. And the problem with copper mining is that we aren't finding new deposits very quickly anymore. The deposits we do find are low quality. They take years, literally from the initial discovery to production, uh, in the Mongolian case, 20 years, and billions of dollars of investment. And they are highly polluting and have a very bad track record of feeling value added back into the communities they do it in. And so in the major area of copper development hitherto, Latin America, they have become hugely controversial to the point of there being a near impasse between the major global mining companies and national governments and indigenous communities and activist communities in those Latin American dem democracies. And so the significance of the Mongolian discovery at, I'm going to mangle this, but I'm going to try and say it, Oyu Olgoy, Mongolia itself, of course, being a democracy in the region and quite a vibrant and complicated one, but nevertheless a pluralistic society, is that it is one of the very few highly significant copper discoveries of recent decades. Uh, Rio Tinto has gone in and tried to make a fist of it, but it has taken $7 billion plus of investment. This is not an open cast mine. It has an open, you'll see pictures of it. It has an open cast entry, but the actual mining is going to be done underground. So this is classic, very heavy investment, very high risk engineering project. And it will be at peak production, which according to Rio Tinto will come as early as the 2030s, the number four, number five biggest copper mine in the world. Unfortunately, then they, they expect production to tail off quite quickly after that. So this is a, a typical example of the kind of high urgency, high pressure, high stakes, high investment mining project that we are going to see more and more of in coming decades as the energy transition intensifies. So that's the that's the urgency of this. The, the geopolitics of this is complicated because the by far and away the biggest buyer of copper in general is China. And Mongolia's, you know, 90% of Mongolia's exports go there. Yeah, it, it seems like Mongolia has become this global player because of its copper mining and obviously, a lot of Western businesses are now trying to get involved in Mongolia. And the Biden administration, in fact, seems to be courting Mongolia. There was a recent state visit. But I'm curious, is, is you know, Mongolia really a place where geography is going to be its destiny? I mean, it seems in terms of spheres of influence, it's always sort of oscillated between China and Russia. Is it possible to imagine it leaving either orbit and coming under the wing of the United States? I think I think that would be uh, you know a total fantasy in the 1990s in the unipolar moment where America's footprint expanded into Central Asia and then in the you know the war of terror moment of the early 2000s when America had a big presence in Afghanistan and was negotiating with a relatively cooperative Putin for bases and alignments with the Central Asian governments um that's 20 years ago now it's very difficult to imagine that kind of scenario replaying it's significant that Mongolia is has abstained from lining up with sanctions against Russia. It simply can't afford to do that. It's far too dangerous. And the overwhelming majority of its exports go to China. I mean, if you read the conversations about Mongolia's position, they have a kind of hallucinogenic quality, it has to be said, like the because it's landlocked. It's the largest, I think, to entirely landlocked state in the world. So there's really no access to the outside world except by way of rail for heavy goods or flight. But that in turn requires an open skies agreement. So, you know, I think with Kashmir, there's actually a, a live discussion of using drones 
to deliver cash. I mean, you can kind of see it working with cashmere because it's extremely wool and very, very, it's extremely light rather and very high value. But there's really no way that you're going to, you know, if Rio Tinto is building a copper mine in in Mongolia, there's only really one place that copper is going, presumably, and that's that's to China. So I think this is a, loca- a place where geography has a massively determining influence. And the question really is, can we arrange a politics which enables, can we, who, who, who am I talking about, can the great powers and the very bold individuals pursuing Mongolian grand strategy locally, can they arrange a modi spivendi essentially so it's not in the interest of either of the potential dominant neighboring powers to you know, essentially exercise hegemony over what is bound to be a relatively fragile, small state. Does that imply a slide back into some sort of one-party regime? I don't think it does, actually. It'll be an interesting test case. But one shouldn't underestimate just how fragile and just how small the population of Mongolia is. Ultimately, this is not just a, it's not just, I think, a question of, to go back to your question, is clearly geography is playing a very powerful role here, but you could also say demography is too, in the sense that there is no reasonable scenario in which Mongolia develops into a society that was too large to dominate. And there are some places which are always going to be too big to dominate. India, for instance, under the British British rule, it was always going to be skin deep, the extent of British control over a society that large and that complex. A country of Mongolia's shape and size um, is a very different proposition. This doesn't, I think, preclude the possibility, and, and, and they're, they're showing remarkable autonomy. But in the end, yes, when you're saying things like, um, on the recent visit to Washington, are celebrating open skies agreements with China, which allow direct flights from Ulaanbaatar to San Francisco and Washington. Commentators said direct flights are essential for Mongolia's democracy and prosperity and expanding our economy. And when that is evidently the case, I think it's a sign of just how fragile you're operating a kind of on a Berlin airlift model if you choose to turn this into a Cold War scenario, which from their point of view, from Mongolia's point of view, presumably would be disastrous. I suppose we do need to end the conversation here, although I realize I maybe should have asked at the very start whether you've ever been to Mongolia. I don't know the answer. No, no, that. never, okay, never no. had the privilege. No, no, I, I have I have friends, several friends who who have been and say it was a, it was really a kind of utterly just mind, not blowing isn't quite the right word, but just hugely mind expanding mm. and a uh, fascinating experience. Well, maybe we do a live show there. Who knows? A La Batur, maybe in a yurt somewhere outside in the countryside. Who knows? Uh, we'll see. But we do need to end here. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Tooze, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TOOZE at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week.